welcome to our channel, Life as God Intended. And today I'm coming to you again from beautiful Waikiki Beach in Honolulu, Hawaii. My backdrop here is at the Royal Hawaiian Center, a beautiful shopping mall in this uh, lush uh, vegetation of Hawaii. And so I'm pleased to bring this broadcast to you where we're gonna be tackling a very important subject that is too often misunderstood. So what does it truly mean to be good? And so how is goodness recognized and measured in our spiritual journey? So let's explore these profound questions by reflecting on an encounter between Jesus and a religious ruler, which is recorded for us in the Gospels. I want you to imagine a religious ruler approaching Jesus, because obviously this occurred, and he was seeking the key to eternal life. So he had a very significant request that he was asking the Lord. And he addressed Jesus very respectfully as good master. Jesus kind of stopped him right there. And Jesus' response is rather startling. He challenges the ruler's understanding of goodness, revealing that absolute goodness belongs to God alone. So this is a fascinating interaction that takes place with Jesus and this ruler. But it also hearkens us back to an original conversation that happened in the Garden of Eden, where humanity's understanding of good and evil was first tested. We learn that in our natural sinful state that Paul talks about there in Ephesians chapter two, one to three, that no good thing dwells within us. And as Romans seven eighteen reminds us and is echoed in Romans 3, 12, none is good, no, not one. Now, obviously, Adam was good, and we're gonna define why he was good as we progress in this discussion. But the rest of us, and ever since Adam sinned, and uh, we participated in the fall with Adam, then no one is good, and that's what these passages of scripture are alluding to, whether it's Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, whether it's Romans 7, 18, or whether it's Romans 3, 12. And so the religious ruler that uh, addressed Jesus didn't realize that true goodness is not something that we achieve. He thought that we achieved it. I think a lot of us today have thought the same thing. We've been misguided and misled. It, he thought it was that he could achieve it by his own efforts. But the truth is that it must be derived from God. Very few people understand that God created man as a derivative choosing creature. In 3 John and verse 11, it tells us that the one who does good is of God. Did you notice that little word of? That's a derivative word. You derive your goodness of God. You're not good in and of yourself. And this means that to truly fulfill God's requirements, we must recognize that goodness reflects God's character, not something that you and I can manufacture on our own. That's the lie that we've been taught, that we have believed continuing to pass on. You see, attributes like faithfulness, love, truthfulness, goodness, are inherent to God alone. And our expressions of these character traits are possible only through God's grace. These are the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this is a humbling realization for some, but it's also a very liberating uh, revelation, freeing us from the impossible task 
of trying to be good by our own strength. Religion falls into the trap of hypocrisy, much like the ruler pretending to be good for God while failing to recognize our human incapacity to achieve such goodness independently. It's an impossibility. To live as God intended, we must abandon our pious attempts at performance and our obsession with material wealth. That, of course, was this ruler's problem. He was concerned with all of those things. He wasn't, he really didn't understand uh, what was going on. And so Jesus challenged the ruler, and I believe he challenges us today, not to measure our lives by our possessions, what we have, or our outward performance, or what we can do. Instead, we should focus on participating with him, allowing his life to guide and to transform us. For many, unfortunately, wealth and prosperity have long been seen as signs of God's favor. But notice what Jesus did to the ruler, the rich ruler. Jesus flips this idea on its head, showing that true goodness is not about what we have, but about who we are in relationship with. His call to the ruler was not about a vow of poverty, but about realigning priorities and relationally connecting with Christ. Jesus used the vivid image of a camel passing through the eye of a needle to illustrate how impossible it is to achieve divine goodness through human efforts. But here's the good news. What's impossible for man is possible with God. Through his grace, we can overcome our limitations and live as God intended. The confusion about goodness isn't new. As I've already alluded to, it's traced back to the Garden of Eden when Satan first planted the seeds of doubt in their minds. And ever since, humanity has struggled with the idea that we can be good on our own. But the truth is, goodness is not an independent standard. It is found only in God himself. And Christianity teaches that God alone is good. So what's the implication? The implication is that any attempt on yours or my part to define or achieve goodness apart from Christ is idolatrous and self-centered. And this misunderstanding continues to lead many astray. But scripture is clear. In Jesus' words in Mark chapter 10 and verse 18, there is none good but God alone. So, to truly participate in God's goodness, we must first acknowledge that He is the source of all that is good. Knowing God through Jesus Christ is the only way that we can experience and express true goodness in our lives. As 3 John 1, 11 states, the one who does good is of God. So our responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, is not to produce goodness because we can't, certainly not by our efforts, but to participate in the goodness that flows from the character of God that's living within us. Our responsibility is a response. It's our response to his ability, responsibility, responding to his ability. And by embracing his grace, we allow his goodness to be expressed through us, transforming our behavior and aligning our lives 
with his will. So what does a godly life look like? It's not about titles, performances, or processions. It's about deriving goodness from our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Did you notice the shift that's taking place here as we allow the truth to penetrate our hearts and minds? It's about deriving goodness from our relationship as we shift our focus from self-effort to divine grace. We experience the transformative power and enabling of God himself to allow us to experience life as he intended. Would you take a moment right now to reflect on your life? Have you been trying to achieve goodness through your own efforts, reading your Bible, praying, going to church, witnessing, tithing, whatever it might have been? Or are you finally discovering the beauty of a personal intimate relationship with Christ where he's come to live through you as your very life? Are you beginning to derive his life? Are you beginning to experience his life? Look to deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the way that that can be accomplished is allowing him, <laughs> allowing his life and his character to be expressed through you. He will prompt you. He will speak to you. He will say, here's what I would like to express through you in this given moment. Let's go. Let's, let's begin to, to participate. Let's no longer be preoccupied with performance and possessions. These things are fleeting. This world is passing away. Let's begin to embrace the dynamic activity of God's grace in our life. Follow Christ and begin to experience the fullness of life as God intended. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for giving me a thumbs up, for subscribing if you haven't, sharing these videos with your friends, and I love hearing from you leaving your comments below. Till next time, it's my prayer for you that you experience all of God's goodness by participating with him and thereby experiencing life as God intended.